Thank you, Sam, for inviting me. I think um, it's such a privilege, actually. Like, like I said, um, I was uh, building DepScan as my personal project. Didn't uh, take it very seriously, and then um, slowly uh, it started finding some users. And uh, uh, a couple of months ago, it was donated to OVASP. So now it is OVASP uh, DepScan. Uh, you can call it Dep-Scan, Dep-Scan, capital D, capital S. Um, I'm okay. Uh, uh, there's no time to think about a name, so fine. Uh, but version 5, upcoming, so that's the key. So I'm going to talk about version 5, uh, version, not version 4. And um, yes, I have a consulting company, AppThreat. So that's how I'm funding all the open source projects. So we have... Um, Atom, um, uh, Sam mentioned CD Exchange, which is the SPOM tool. Again, uh, CD Exchange was one of my personal hobby project, uh, which is now part of uh, Cyclone DX. Uh, I have Blint, a binary linting tool, and DepScan. So uh, a few years ago, my idea behind AppThread was to uh, make a highly integrated application security platform. and. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, I couldn't find enough funding, enough money, uh, but uh, I did uh, uh, become the chief architect of another startup company called ShiftLeft. So I spent uh, nearly four years building next-gen SaaS platform. Um, so uh, no uh, bits and pieces about things like uh, program analysis, code analysis, and so on. Spent a lot of time on SaaS, and in the, in the end, uh, Sometime last year, I realized uh, it's simply not possible to build SAST. It's simply not possible to build a highly accurate SAST without, without false positives. So um, I pivoted, started spending more time on supply chain security uh, because I found uh, CD Action and DepScan becoming popular. And I thought, OK, let's um, use that program analysis knowledge, that code analysis knowledge, see what we can do with uh, Supply chain security, S bomb. Uh, I'm so sorry for using S uh, S bomb. Even I'm getting tired personally. Sorry about that. But uh, <laughs> um, uh, maybe I'll try to avoid it. I'll say full stack inventory, or I'll say, try to come up with some other ways of uh, describing the same thing. Uh, so what you are about to see today uh, is exclusive. I've not shown it to many people. Maybe two or three friends. Um, uh, I'm presenting it, but I have another colleague, Caroline, who also contributed a lot. Uh, she's in North Carolina. Um, she couldn't be here. Um, we've been doing this for a year now. So this is work of two hardworking people handcrafting things, no AI involved. Sorry about that. A <laughs> lot, uh, lot of artisan work, and um, I want to focus on these three areas, and obviously, uh, uh, towards the end, I will show uh, the DepScan project. Um, but I want to start with asking, um, is open source risky? Like, show of hands, who, how many people think open source is risk? Okay. Uh, okay. And who here thinks open source is not risky? OK. <laughs> Some supporters, awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, and then, yes, I would definitely uh, uh, touch upon uh, supply chain security from open source. So we, we all kind of are understanding that open source is risky. Um, but then why would you use supply chain security tool? Or why should you use supply chain security tool from open source, which are risky, right? And then I will touch upon uh, uh, the the, the DepScan project. So um, so that's that's what we are uh, we are forced to believe, isn't it? Like uh, like I've been doing open source for ten years, um, and last few years even I am getting convinced that open source is risky, right? Like OWASP, every project is open source. <laughs> uh, so at at some point, like like uh, I don't know whether you guys are seeing it here. There are like. 752 million pages on Google about open source risks. Like, that's more than coronavirus, COVID. <laughs> is it like, is it like, uh, like, and then, and then you go to YouTube, uh, top 10 risks open source. Um, 
uh, yeah, the, fir the, 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 the first video, Enric, um, uh, is in a security researcher. Maybe he has some right to say open source is risky. He has published like 10 papers about uh, supply chain risk. Okay, so you get like, like a sticker. Uh, but then random YouTubers, right? Like, I can't even pronounce it. Goma, gomahamaya.com, like, like, like random YouTubers talk about open source risk. Because that's like, like, yeah, you make money, right? Like you, you I'm sure uh, even on TikTok, if you search for open source risk, like you'll find uh, a lot of TikTokers. Uh, uh, so that's what is happening, right? Like the more you say, the more you amplify, uh, the more uh, beneficial it is becoming. But uh, honestly, like if you see this, uh, this section, risks of using open source, the first one is vulnerabilities are public knowledge. Is that a risk? Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Vulnerabilities are public knowledge is like the greatest strength of open source. Right, like, like, uh, like the other day I read that only 20 zero days out of 1,024 of iOS has come out. Do you guys feel secure? Uh, because you don't know 1,000 vulnerabilities, iOS vulnerabilities that has not come out? Like, whereas Android, it's impossible to hide a zero day because thousands of people are reviewing it. It's like not possible, it'll just come out, right? Uh, like, you, you go through most of these risks, you are like, uh, they can be generalized to any source code. Like, I, I did a SaaS company. I know how many bugs exist in commercial code. So open source code, in fact, is actually more secure more risk-free than commercial code. I can promise you that, right? Um, so all of these guys are like, yeah, they have an agenda. They have, uh, they, it, it's a system, right? We have to work together to kind of change it. We have to make things secure by default. And uh, you don't make things secure by default by scaring people away. But yeah, you, you collaborate, like OS Foundation, for example, amazing uh, foundation, uh, purpose-built for making the whole uh, world of so software secure, right? Uh, so yeah, uh, so I uh, have a different view that open source is not more riskier than uh, commercial. And what we have to understand is uh, open source publishers, right? Like uh, artisans like myself, we try to build tools. Uh, we might focus on something, like it's an art, right? Like creating a tool like Debscan or CDXGen is an art. Uh, Few years ago, when I tried to build the tool, there was no book on how to build an S bomb. There was no chat GPT. I couldn't have asked. Uh, maybe this year I could have asked, "Hey, build DevScan for me." Um, uh, but there was no book, right? You're learning. You're trying to. You're trying to build. And um, uh, what what does happen is the same tool, uh, same work of artisans, gets sold in shops. People may not go to artisan market, but they might buy the same product from a shop and they might feel happy. Uh, same way, the number of commercial companies that bundle <laughs> dependency track, OS, Zap, CDXGen, uh, people will say open source is bad. The, the commercial companies will also market that open source is risky, but then they are actually bundling open source tools and people will happily pay for it. Uh, rather than paying the uh, the artists artisans directly, so which is uh, which, is, which is something we need to think about. Um, we need to th look at the big picture, not uh, look at uh, just the marketing brochures and, and so. On. Uh, I fortunately was able to make the transition. So I was like an artist, I was like creator, and uh, and then I was able to f form a consulting company to fund the open source project, which not many artisans would do, so they, the projects will, uh, will get archived, will exist, but cannot be constantly improved, whereas I was fortunate enough to keep funding uh, these projects for over five years now, so which, is, uh, which is good. And uh, transitioning from uh, uh, a project that's fully self-funded to something that's part of a foundation, so you have like a larger community uh, you know, fantastic uh, people to talk to, get some feedback, and so on. And uh, uh, I'm really looking forward for the 
the questions and the feedback, because that is how I think uh, these open source tools, we can keep improving, we can keep, you know, uh, uh, trying to solve um, a, a problem. Uh, why security from open source? Yes, uh, you could go buy security from commercial companies, but then you're getting locked into a system. It's very hard to take your data out, right? And, and it's, it's analogous to subscription medicine. Okay, you're not going to get a cure. You are get, going to get, get, get that medicine packaged every month, so you will have some remedy, some temporary relief. Uh, whereas open source, there is no lock-in. I don't actually care uh, whether you continue to use DevScan for five years, 10 years. I've, yeah, I'd love if you are a very uh, uh, yeah, long-term user, but that's not my problem. And also, uh, DevScan, CDXGen, they all follow Cyclone DX, right? Like everything you will see today are built on top of Cyclone DX s right? The specification is open source. The tool is open source. Uh, even if you do not like DevScan, but like Cyclone DX, you can still build your own workflows tooling processes around it. No, uh, no lock-in. And uh, we are, uh, because, because the whole world is biased against open source, we are actually working very hard to show that we are not a risk. So which means we are better suited to safeguard your company against open source risks, right? Um, so yeah, I can go on and on. And uh, yeah, uh, I I've, uh, honestly believe that uh, the days of commercial supply chain security is over, as we know it, uh, because open source, uh, Yes, we are going to show you, we are going to show you at least in the coming uh, months, amazing features from dependency track, dependency check, depth scan. I don't know why it, uh, uh, OS has three dependency product, but <laughs> let's go with that. Maybe but more. <laughs> maybe more, isn't it? Uh, that is another uh, thing we have to think about. But um, yeah, we are coming up with high quality capabilities for free open source that we will make a statement uh, to the, the enterprises as to uh, what is it they're doing. Um, so, depth scan. Uh, even I forgot depth scan, honestly, so <laughs> uh, it, is, it is built to forget, right? I don't want depth scan uh, to block your PRs. I don't want depth scan to raise 100 pull requests with the depth scan logo saying this pull request was blocked by depth scan or, or this single CVE requires a single patch and here is a pull request. I don't, I don't like that model. That's, that's not the correct way to build any tool, uh, let alone a CA tool, right? Uh, it used to be my personal tool uh, till 2018 uh, because I didn't like any of the tools out there. I was, uh, I was doing a lot of open source and I felt like all these bots and things like that were stopping me from doing my work. And I was like, okay, I'm going to build my own tool. I'm not going to use any of these tools. And um, I started uh, using this tool get, to get consulting projects. I think we have one of my first customers here uh, from years ago. Um, yeah, I, I was showing depth scan to get the credibility because, you know, Prabhu application security, what does it know? I show depth scan, all these things, and then uh, and slowly, DevScan started getting bundled into a uh, bunch of ASPM tools. Okay, um, uh, I now have uh, uh, so white labeling bundling. I have a few clients who actually bundle DevScan and then they show it as their own. And sometimes they actually go and say open source is risky again, just like. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and from 22, uh, 2022, I had this Eureka moment. I'm like, yeah, let's give DevScan uh, to everybody. Let's uh, get more downloads. Uh, I think I have now have 400 downloads, which is like awesome. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, from 2023, it's now uh, an OWASP uh, project. And um, built to forget, next generation analysis. Um, so I, yeah. The, the shift lift experience, SAS experience, taught me a thing or two about how we can do better. So I will show some next generation analysis, not AI analysis. And DevScan is 
free, open source, complete privacy. The whole thing can work in air-gapped environment requires no internet connectivity. All of the analysis are performed in the CI-CD system. No application, no SBOM ever leaves your system, right? There's no talking to OSV, there's no talking to depths.dev, there's just nothing going out, like complete private. Which, it, it turns out, even dependency track does send some data out to OSV and so on. So this is the only uh, dependency uh, scanning product uh, in open source that's 100% private. Okay, and um, I'm gonna sh start with demo and then um, happy to take questions, like we can make it interactive, I can go deeper, if you want to go like very technical, deeper, yes, happy to do that, or uh, broader, philosophical, yes, and, and, and so. Okay, so, um, so I just ran depth scan, uh, it, it does take a couple of minutes, so uh, what I can do is uh, I can show some of the previous runs, I, I, I did run it earlier today, so I don't want to waste two minutes of your time. And uh, depth scan is packaged as a... Uh, I, let me try to... Any better? Okay. So depth scan is uh, a Python package, but uh, we bundle it as container image and so on. So we have single application executables, container image, uh, it's one command, depth scan with some arguments. Um, so this is uh, the output for a Java project. It's, it's a vulnerable Java application, OS project, um, seeded with vulnerabilities. And uh, these are real data, okay? I'm not mocking or anything. And uh, let's just start showing some, some unique bits that only depth scan can do. Um, uh, to start with, uh, depth scan can prove whether the vulnerability is both reachable and exploitable. There is no trickery. This is solid reachability analysis, exploitability analysis, completely private, open source, okay? Depth scan knows precise usage in how many places the given library is used. Okay, um, you can see that here it is reachable, but it's not exploitable. So it, it can do all the computation. Uh, let me keep going, 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 going. So we have all these data, and um, uh, there are multiple ways to run depth scan. So what I'm showing here is the complete verbose mode, um, so that you are starting to trust the tool, right? Like, if, like okay, Prabhu's tool, depth scan, does it work? Is it legit? Yeah, you can run it in verbose mode, so it's plotting all the tables, explaining everything. But then, yes, you can just turn off all of that. You can run it in, in quiet mode, and I promise you, it will not block your peer unless it legitimately thinks that there is a reachable, exploitable vulnerability in your application. Okay? Um, so, so after showing all of the data, TipScan can prioritize the results. So here is uh, uh, an example for this project where TipScan says, here are the four or five packages that needs to be updated, and it's giving the reason, okay, reachable S, yes, and so on. It also has the fixed version. Uh, then it says you can remediate up to 140 vulnerabilities by updating the package and so on. So, so most people, uh, like I said, this is a sample vulnerable application. So it has a lot of uh, vulnerable packages and so on. I will show uh, a real application for a, for, a, for a new customer. We just signed up yesterday, okay? <laughs> and uh, we'll see how their data looks like. And then, um, yeah, I can, like, yeah, if there are any questions, maybe if there are questions I can answer, I can show some technical bits and, and, and so on. Okay, so we so, so far saw prioritization using uh, reachability and exploitability analysis. But what if there are no vulnerabilities? What if you want to be proactive, right? Like imagine somebody building a time machine and telling Equifax that, hey, you need to pay attention to Struts vulnerability. 
Struts is the word you need to know because if there is any vulnerability, you will be exploited. Depth scan can do that. Depth scan can find top reachable packages even without vulnerabilities. Okay, so you can be proactive for the first time. You can you can know, you can track, and it even tells you that um, you can set up alerts and notifications to monitor these packages because there will be in the S form there'll be hundreds of packages, right? Like you have to know, okay, which one should I tr start tracking, right? And um, we can we can do this a lot. I'll explain how we can improve this uh, next year, and obviously, you know, I'll seek feedback. Um, so we we are the first tool. In fact, um, um, I learned a thing a thing or two about how commercial companies do it, and and so on, right? And um, I, I even have a slide explaining the various styles of reachability analysis. The model we went with, with CD action and depth scan, is computing the reachability first and then checking for vulnerabilities. So it, it adds a bit of time, but it makes the whole journey more proactive. Whereas the, the approach most, most commercial companies have done is to only sh show reachable, uh, reachable flows that also have vulnerabilities. So it is entirely just prioritization, okay? Proactiveness versus uh, uh, prioritization. Like I said, uh, we want to make the whole thing secure, not have uh, you know monthly uh, subscription and so on. And uh, Depscan is trying to prove the reachable flows. Okay, but this is again very important, right? You can technically build uh, a SaaS tool or any analysis tool by just grepping for keywords. I think there is a very popular company <laughs> that is actually doing that. And then, and then you ask that tool, okay, prove it to me, explain it to me, how you, why you think this is a vulnerability. Like, like, I don't know, I just found these keywords, right? Uh, whereas depth scan is an advanced tool that can explain itself. Okay, um, like I said, uh, this is not released. Uh, when it goes live, you can, you can run depth scan against any application. It, it will be aim to make it work out of the box legitimate advice, legitimate thing, but not AI, okay? Um, to start with, uh, yeah, we'll go through all these things, but you can see that uh, not only depth scan is plotting the flow, but it is, it is also tagging it with the, with, the, with the libraries, the packages, and it is also assigning some tags as to what that method does. So we have uh, implemented uh, like a simplistic auto-tagging mechanism, again, not AI, to tag code, okay? So in fact, the whole reachability analysis we are performing based on tagging. Um, so let's look at another uh, example. So here, the code is tagging and it's, it's spotting something interesting. It's spotting a method that, that is a potential mitigation so it is even saying, check if the mitigation used in this flow is valid and appropriate. So at, at this point, DepScan doesn't know whether this is a false positive or not. So it knows there is a reachable flow. It, it knows the input can be used to reach two packages, fast JSON and embed core, but it doesn't know whether there is uh, mitigation involved. So it is possible to know um, uh, use some configuration files to tell depth scan which method patterns are safe, can be trusted, and so on. So we will introduce this kind of uh, remediation workflow to train your own depth scan to recognize your own uh, coding um, stuff. And lastly, it gives you some ideas. It says to improve the security posture, implement a common validation middleware because it knows that not every flow has been validated, sanitized, so it's giving uh, uh, an advice. Any, any question? Any? Drop a microphone. Yeah. Hi. Um, you previously mentioned that it's all private and you don't do any call to the internet. How often do you update the database? So to find the vulnerabilities. 
So the, 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 the vulnerability database gets downloaded first. So what we do is we have a Hap Threat Vulnerability DB project. Um, that has the vulnerabilities. So very first run, DepScan will download this database. And then all the, uh, all the checks will be uh, performed locally. And uh, what we do is we build this uh, database every eight hours or so. Uh, but what we encourage customers, users, is to fork this project, copy this project, and build it themselves. So they don't even have to use the version we are building. OK, so then to stay more up up to date with that, I need to follow the latest version, right? To be more secure in this case. Correct. You can keep building it. Like you can, uh, there is a this uses GitHub Actions workflow mm -hmm. to build it. Um, it takes like eleven minutes. So yeah, you have a workflow, and the whole database is a single file, and uh, you can point depth scan at a at the VDB home directory containing this file, and uh, that'll be used for vulnerabilities. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and uh, what this uh, basically uh, uh, project does is it gets all the vulnerabilities from the upstream projects. So, so here is the full list of upstream we we support. Uh, yeah, hundred percent private. Wonderful. Uh, more questions? Yeah, there's a question. Can you go a little bit in depth on the reachability analysis and how do you do reachability analysis offline and uh, what kind of file do you analyze to do the reachability analysis? Do you call trace or what do you do for reachability? Okay, I, I have a slide I will explain, but uh, we do all of this statically. There's no tracing, there's no nothing involved. It takes a couple of minutes. So if I show this example project on, on GitHub, yeah. Uh, the we aim for two to five minutes with full full pack, full reachability, everything. Whereas the, nor the, the normal vulnerability analysis will usually take only seconds. And is first, is first dependencies or you do the full tree analysis and full stack trace? So if you call a library and a library, call a library and a library, call a library, do you do first level dependencies or you go all the way down? Okay, how many how many levels yeah. of reachability we do, and and so on. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, we are currently looking at only the direct dependencies, so the first level, the the full tree is in the S bomb file. Like when when CDX gen generates the S bomb, it has a, a lot of information. It has the full dependency tree. It has evidences, everything. But from a prioritization perspective, we only focus on directly reachable libraries. Thank you. Another question? Yeah, um, I'm quite curious about the reachability part, actually. So if you have a slide, I'll let you present, and then I'll see if it answers most of them. Cool. Um, but um, so you know when Log4Gel came out, most of the people impacted uh, were uh, impacted from um, indirect dependencies because log4j is log4j is everywhere. And, yes. Um, so how would you kind of be sure that your users are not ignoring the not reachable ones because they could ignore um, exploitable vulnerabilities? That's right. So uh, you can see log4j API. It says yes. So. Um, it was, it, it was a common um, weakness in every tool. Okay, so when, uh, when log4j came out, um, uh, firstly, I can, yeah, I can go along. So when, anyway, so when, when log4j came out, uh, the, the person filed the uh, vulnerability against log4j implementation packages, okay, IMPL packages. Um, and then what they found was, because the quality of SBOM tools at the time were so low, none of them even had the IMPL packages. So nobody actually saw the log for shell vulnerability in any SCA tool. So GitHub, uh, in the right wisdom, misfiled against the API package, which is the only package most SPOM tools reported. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we had to do that thing. And um, 
because I had that knowledge, uh, with depth scan, we do two things. Um, there is a fallback mode where uh, even runtime dependencies, as long as there is a, a, a occurrence usage, it would be considered reachable, runtime packages. Okay, uh, I can even show the comment on depth scan where it's saying, let's fall back here. Um, the, the second thing is uh, we, um, uh, we use the Java native class loader. So what we do is, uh, uh, for Java project, the, the application has to be compiled first, not built, compiled. Anyway, the Cyclone DX Maven plugin requires the application to be compiled. So the good thing about Java is when you compile, all the jar files get downloaded. So they are there. So what then depth scan uh, via uh, the Atom project does is it uses the Java class loader to load all the jar files. So the logging, log4j, all the libraries would get loaded in the class loaders. We then ask the class loader, OK, give me all the classes you have just loaded. And then we get the classes, and then we map it back to the SBOM. That's how we are saying, OK, these packages are reachable because they got loaded and so on. So the approach, I think, Andrew. Any more questions on this part of the demo? No. OK, no? okay. I think we can continue. Continue. Thank you. Uh, Okay, so uh, let's talk about analysis, which is the uh, big thing. Um, let's see if I can zoom it a bit so I can see. Okay, so uh, this is like program analysis 101, code analysis 101. Uh, I actually offer a course to university students on this topic. Uh, so the fundamental thing is like spell checker versus grammar checker. Right? Like we are used to spell checking on Microsoft Word, very horrible, right? And then the next generation grammar checkers are coming, and then there's a lot of innovations happening in that space. Uh, a similar journey is happening in program analysis phase, okay? So we have um, syntactic structures, like abstract syntax tree, um, which is what all the linting tools use, like ESLint or um, uh, formatting tools. Uh, sonar cube you know all these are linting tools uh, they operate on syntax trees and one one enhancement we can do with this basic structure is to uh, start tracking what is called as control flows you know if conditions for loops while loops so you are you you are also knowing that some syntax uh, some syntactic nodes are only applicable in certain cases so you you have some some knowledge um, on what we are doing. So we can have some false positive tuning, right? Like instead of saying, uh, look, you are invoking with shell equal to true, you can say, oh, you are invoking with only this specific condition, and so on. Some, some improvement we can do. And uh, most gripping tool operate in this area, right? Uh, and, and the kind of understanding you can get on a, from a tool perspective is you can say, okay, this is some Java application, or this is a JavaScript application. You don't know, you can't, you can't understand anything beyond that from just the syntax, okay? We have to start de going deeper into the semantics. We have to start uh, going deeper into you know, the purpose and so on, right? So then the next uh, enhancement we can do is uh, start identifying program dependency, which is, okay, what are all the libraries this program or application is dependent on? And uh, we now have SBOM tools like CDXGen. Um, so, um, so computing that has become, has become very easy, right? So you, you get the tool to give you that list, and then while uh, parsing the application, you can check and then you can find out which of these are uh, dependencies, and then the, which of these are direct dependencies, indirect dependencies, transitive, and, and so on, right? And um, with this knowledge, we can build what is called as data dependency graph, which is, uh, okay, I know these are the inputs to my application, and out of these inputs, these could be controlled by a user. And then you can start tracking the, the flow of data. So you can, you can start doing some some computation out of it. This is where uh, you would find uh, some, some new startups, upstarts, offering reachability analysis operate. 
very, very, very precise. Once you have both the program dependency and data dependency, the, uh, the kind of reachable flows you can compute is uh, very precise, very, very nice. Um, there, is, there is one major downside here, which is um, uh, what is called as um, database, a symbols database. So while, while I answer the gentleman's question by saying, oh, we download the vulnerability database, but there's another database that every commercial company use, which is the symbols database. What, 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 what does it have? Just the class names, method names of all libraries. Somebody has to parse all of Maven library, NPM, and you get. So they know all of the modules, all of the things. Uh, so when they see that symbol, they can then go and map it back to the package. And then they can understand what this package does. Is it a SQL library? Is it a web framework? What, what does it do? Okay, so we need that database. Um, if you have the database, yes, you can do, uh, you can have a very highly performant product, uh, very precise. And uh, unfortunately, CDX and DevScan doesn't have a database. I can't, I, we, we cannot produce, even with OS money, a free database for the whole world that gets downloaded and used, because that database will be significant. We can't host it on GitHub. Uh, there's no money, there's no budget. So uh, uh, it, last year, honestly, we couldn't do this. It took us a whole year to crack this. And the way we have solved it is with three, uh, three things. Uh, we invented type inference. So earlier this year, I went to um, Cape Town. So I, uh, I met a young chap, uh, David, a PhD student from uh, uh, Stellenbosch University. And um, he was working on a machine learning paper to predict the type. OK, so the, 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 the principle behind this innovation is given a structure, program structure, not, not the syntax, like the structure, you would then predict what must be the type that, that has this structure and, and, and so on. And uh, I got very fascinated. I was like, okay, this will make a great thing in the supply chain space. So, um, so we worked together. We, pr we have produced and open source the first type inference engine that can work for both static and dynamic languages, typed and untyped versions. So Java, JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, and in Python, typed Python, untyped Python, we can still predict the type, even without the symbols database, just by the structure analysis. Then once we predict the type, we, we are also able to predict the package that must have provided the type because we have the SPOM. So this is like uh, the, the analogy I use is, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it is a duck. <laughs> you don't need a database to tell you it is a duck. So because CD Action is producing such a, a, a detailed description of the component it sees, we are able to easily predict the package. So we call it as package inference. And then uh, lastly, after predicting it, we are able to tag. Because this package is, is this uh, library which also has these these it must be doing this and the auto tagging is actually uh, can be improved um, it is working reliably that's why we are able to show it and we are able to you know we can put it live nobody will laugh at us okay uh, but next year um, we have big ambition to implement semantic tagging semantic tagging is um, uh, usually applicable for custom code where uh, we don't know what the code is. There's no equivalent open source code. So we will try to predict what the custom code must be doing. So we don't have to ask the user, hey, is this a validation function? Is this a sanitization function? Because we will know uh, that it is doing what it is supposed to do. And then last thing is um, uh, the current state of art reachability uh, is um, in, uh, inter package, but not inter-service. So I think uh, Ashish spoke about how we have a lot of microservices nowadays, orchest orchestrated and so on, right? So while we are able to track the flow per service, 
we are not able to tra track it across the services. So if, if we expose depth scan to a mono repo containing tens of services and so on, uh, we need more work to be done to stitch the flows together to prove that this flow starts from microservice A, traverses all of it. Uh, but we are more confident open source people will do it first, not commercial people. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, so a couple of a couple of areas we can improve. And uh, why are we doing all these things? We can we can start answering these questions. What does this application do? Uh, why, when, and how the libraries are used, and how can it be improved? You know. Uh, we are, I'm personally so tired of false positives in SAST, I don't want the SCA tools to bombard you with false positives. So we are spending a lot of time to uh, implement this explainability into the tool itself. So the tool, when it tells you it is reachable, it knows itself that it is reachable, not, um, not made up and so on. Any, any questions here? Let me take a pause. And, Okay, yeah, there's a question. Just a quick one. Um, why are you trying so hard to do this offline? You have a lot more intelligence in the context. So if you correlate, like the example you made in a microservice, like you might have a piece, two or three pieces of course that runs in a microservice and two others in, a, in another microservice. In an ASPM world, you know which application actually bundle all of these up and which piece of code actually call this function. Okay. Why not using their knowledge? So collect, uh, so ASPM has the benefit of collecting the data from various sources and then they have, uh, they have it in the centralized place. Uh, yeah, I was working on a project called ThreadDB uh, briefly, which is like a graph database to store all of this data um, and, and so on. So that is, that is one, one approach, uh, very interesting. Um, I, think I, I think we have to start exploring. Um, like I said, I don't want to take the dependency track route, which is step one, set up a Postgres database, and then you lose 100 percentage of open source users. <laughs> so we want to make it completely databaseless, but uh, we need to, I think, uh, Brainstorm, but uh, very nice idea. We can you know, catch up, we can brainstorm. That's how we do it. Yeah. Cool. One more question. Um, yeah, just uh, in the previous demo, you showed that one vulnerability was reachable and exploitable. Could you do detail more of how do you make one and the other assumption? Like you talked more about the reachability part. How would you get to the exploitable Exploitable, uh, exploitable. Um, uh, Non-exploits. So if the same vulnerability also has known exploits, it fails safes to exploitable. Uh, DepScan is the only product, probably the only product that will not use EPSs. Okay, uh, I don't believe in EPSs. So, uh, um, but I have a research student who is trying to implement exploitability analysis with this data. So, um, so AI machine learning, uh, the key. The key thing to do all these advanced things is the data, not the model, right? Uh, like SPOM tools last year were not as precise as the tools this year, right? So which is one of the reasons why I spent a lot of time improving the tools because I was like, there's no way you can do AI with last generation tools, right? But now uh, with the new generation tools, these sort of precise analysis, Cyclone DX format, you can start doing uh, advanced analysis. So we are uh, confident that we will do a proper exploitability analysis that doesn't look like look at phrases, description text, proper code. Yeah, I think there's a question or comment on EPSS from Francesco, right? Yeah, I'm one of the creator of EPSS. So why why don't you believe in EPSS? <laughs> Yeah, I'll, like, I'll show EPSS, you. EPSS has one good part and one bad part. Like, I, I know why you don't like the pure threat intelligence analysis, and I've been discussing this deeply with Steve Springlet. But there is the secondary part that is actually looking at exploitability analysis of actually verified exploit, plus if you see it in the wild. Now, specific CV like Log4j can be traced in the wild. Other like it can hallucinate and can actually direct 
to the wrong path. But if you look at the white paper that we put together for EBSS, that's just 50% of the data that we use in the ML model. The other 50% is actually the type of vendors, the exploitability verified, the actual verification. We have a bunch of other data that we actually publish as Phoenix on exploitability analysis. But plus you have CISACF that is actually manually configured. You can, you can use a lot of that data to actually fast track that information. You don't actually have to use your own knowledge to actually derive if something is exploitable. Y yes, <laughs> but I'm still not convinced. So um, let, 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 let me try. Let, let's see if we can beat EPSS. That'd be so cool, isn't it? Any, <laughs> any more questions on this part of the presentation? No. Okay, let's move on. Move on. Okay, so uh, this slide I can go deeper into technical bits or I can keep basic uh, up, up, up to you guys. So, reachability analysis. Um, so, we aim for constant time performance, which is when you run depth scan and if it takes, say, two minutes, every subs subsequent run will only take two minutes. So, what it means is it is non deterministic. So, we do throw away some flows that are too hard to compute. Because we're trying to do all this statically, right? Not, we don't have a runtime tracer. We don't have anything else. So if we start tracking a, a flow of package, and then like it's taking a lot of time, like I think it's currently 30 seconds per flow or something. So if computing a flow takes more than 30 seconds, we throw away that, OK? Uh, but I do have examples of complex flows that can be solved within that time period. So we, uh, we are able to capture a lot of flows, but uh, like I said, we aspire for constant time performance. So what this means is, uh, uh, in, in, fa in, in, in fact, that's, that's what we should do anyway, any product. We should use this for prioritization, not as uh, like a proof or single source of truth. Okay, so we cannot for example, discard vulnerabilities that do not have the reachable tag. Okay, so exercise caution. So the one that has the reachable tags, the tool definitely knows they are reachable, but the one without, we don't know actually. Um, and like I said, we, uh, we are doing this with or without libraries uh, to make things proactive, okay? Um, and uh, when it comes to reachability analysis, everybody says reachability analysis, but then uh, let's start understanding some academic terms so you can ask your vendor, okay, tell me what kind of reachability analysis they do, right? And then they're like, oh my God. So to start with, forward reachability analysis. What is forward reachability? You find all the entry points to your applications, okay? Called sources. So web applications, okay, the HTTP routes, inputs. So from the sources, you try to follow till you reach a sync. A sync could be an external library, a database, or a HTTP call, and so on. So this is um, forward reachability analysis, okay? To do forward reachability analysis, you first have to know the entry points. So what is an entry point? For a Spring application, uh, if it has specific annotations, those are called entry points or for an express application, if the file is in the app.use method or app.root method, it's an entry point, right? So you need to build some logic into the tools, which we have done for many frameworks across applications, because we are an open source project, right? We have to work for every single project in the world, right? So we have put some of those in, in, uh, intelligence, and then the rest we try to tag and guess as we go. Um, Forward reachability may not work in all cases. For example, libraries, okay? Uh, Apache Common Validations Library, or like your organization might, might have a library which is only making calls out, like it doesn't have an entry point, doesn't have a root, it doesn't have anything, right? So in these cases, we need to do reverse reachability analysis, which is you start from the sync and try to identify all the possible sources. 
Um, it takes ages with depth scan. So um, uh, with reverse reachability, we, uh, the average time is around 15 minutes. Sometimes it takes hours, okay? So tough luck, it's, it's very difficult to do that without, um, without that, that source's knowledge. Computing from uh, sync back to all possible sources, it's, it's an exponential computation. Maybe, yeah, maybe there could be uh, some shortcuts that we can. And uh, the last kind of uh, reachability is intermodular reachability across packages. So um, uh, if I show uh, an example for, um, so let's see if I have something here. Okay, this one, yeah. So here is an example of a flow where there are so many packages participating. And uh, probably the only uh, implementation that can actually track every single package participating in, in a single flow. Um, again, these things, I mean, people will see our code and then, I mean, this is exactly what we want to do, right? Like we want to spread this knowledge. I actually offer courses to teach people how to do code analysis and so on. And uh, it's absolutely fine if commercial products start implementing such uh, advanced techniques. Um, and if they give us a credit, uh, that's awesome, isn't it? So three kinds of uh, analysis. Anybody wants to see the temporary artifacts, the technical bits, how the analysis, okay, a lot of uses, awesome. So, um, so if I look at uh, the, the files in this project, Java sec code project, okay? So uh, let me do a... So the first thing is app.atom. So, um, sure. Yeah. So what, what we first try to do is uh, we, we try to summarize and create an intermediate representation of the application, okay? The, uh, the problem with perf uh, performing reachability analysis is, um, or any static analysis is if you have an application with 100,000 lines of code, and then you, ha you have 100 libraries which has thousands of imports, you need to take each line and then check all these import statements. So that's, that's a bigger problem. So first what we do is summarize the application and create a small intermediate representation, okay? So just the import statements, just the method names, parameter names, you know, very, very limited information, uh, which we call the Atom. So Atom is uh, both an open source project and a specification to uh, create intermediate representation for um, multiple languages, okay? Um, the, the list of languages here, uh, Atom is built using Scala language uh, because of the, the underlying downstream tool we use is built in Scala, so we are keeping it uh, consistent. Uh, most of these analysis can be performed at raw source code level, but we do need the compilation to solve the package uh, problem we have and, and so on. Okay, so, um, so the, the journey we kind of imagine is uh, people will start with CDX Gen project, which is SBOM, okay, and uh, they would work with dependency track, and then over time they'll be like, okay, I have the SBOM, but I need to know, do more detailed analysis, maybe they can start with depth scan. Uh, they will use depth scan and they will find that depth scan is very opinionated. It, it's doing things in a certain way. Like, why is it not doing APSS? Why is it not doing other things? And then we are hoping that over, over time, people will then start using Atom and they will go low level, start doing this analysis themselves without relying on uh, a project like depth scan to uh, do it for them, okay? So that is, uh, uh, that's a small quick introduction to Atom. There's like a lot of things we can speak. Uh, Atom uh, is based on the PhD uh, paper from David. 
uh, who generously uh, agreed to make things open source and then all of our implementation are open source Apache 2 uh, license. So Atom is, uh, we're using protobuf format. So it is like a, like a packed protobuf binary. Okay, and um, if you have a protobuf client, so I have another project called Chen, Chennai, Chen not AI, to inspect the Atom files, okay? I am not going to waste your time today. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Chen Chennai is an amazing project. I, I would love to present at some point uh, once it's ready. Um, maybe at the pub I can show Chennai. Um, Chennai allows you to work on the Atom file the raw data, you can do advanced things. Um, but the, 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 the information in an Atom file is still too much. So if you see, for example, Atom file is 3.8 meg, whereas the reachables file is like 431 meg usages file. So to do reachability analysis, we again need a much more smaller set of data. So this is where we call it a slicing, okay? So program slicing is a technique to extract only a small layer of information. So we use the same term terminology. Um, so if you look at uh, the reachables um, slices.json, it's a dead symbol JSON file. What it has is flows, okay? And all of these uh, identifiers are mapped exactly to Cyclone DX evidence format so we don't have any lock-in. And what it says is, okay, look, this is the method parameter input, and then uh, the type, uh, if you know it, uh, the method names, signature, file names, line number, and some automatic tagging. Um, so, so we have these flows, and then we have uh, pearls, so if you see. So in this case, there is a flow but there's no package involved, so we exclude that, whereas if you keep looking for flows with some package, we know that. So, um, because DepScan is an SCA tool, it is only interested in those reachable flows uh, that, that could create uh, problems with supply chain. But the tool computes all possible flows, with or without packages, so entirely uh, custom, cu custom code-based stuff and so on. So we have that information, maybe somebody could make use of it to do something much more interesting and so on. So uh, this format is much simpler to work with. So you can consume this file in, in a JavaScript package or a Python package, you don't have to know anything about program analysis and, and so on. So this was one of the innovation we had, uh, a static slicer that can slice uh, a complex program and extract only a small set of uh, information. The, uh, the second style of slicing we do is called as usages slicing. So what, uh, what uh, we do is um, traditionally usages are based on line numbers occurrence, right? So I see this package or this import statement in this line number. Uh, but what we found is that kind of usage analysis again, led to false positives, because um, uh, aliasing is one thing. For example, false negatives. So you could import log4j as Prabhu's logging library, which means you need to start tracking Prabhu's logging library, not log4j. Uh, or, uh, yeah, you could alias a method, you could alias a single variable or the whole module, there's a lot of things going on. Um, uh, or what you can do is, um, you can import the method, but instead of invoking it, you're just passing it as a function pointer or, or, or as a reference to downstream code. So which means at the point of uh, occurrence, there is actually no vulnerability, but the vulnerability occurs when somebody tries to execute this reference and so on. So uh, to cut the long story short, we categorize the usages into four types. Um, where the usage is based on the target object, where the, the, that library is the target, or it's merely used as a, as a definition to create a derivation. And then we are also tracking 
the invoked calls, which is all the calls made from that library, and uh, all the calls where the library itself is an argument. So we are categorizing the occurrence into four uh, different things, uh, which is required to prove that uh, a given import statement is indeed reachable because it's being invoked and so on. So, um, so these are uh, a couple of slices. We also have the data flow slice, which is the reverse reachability analysis. Uh, and because we have a consistent format, uh, if you look at the same uh, thing for a TypeScript project, it will be similar. Once you know the structure, you can easily implement the analysis for a lot of languages. Which is why when DevScan v5 will come out, it will support four languages, whereas commercial companies usually do Agile, which is like one language first, and so on. Um, fascinating stuff. Is it enough? Should I go in more, much more detail or any questions? I think we're short of time. Short of time, okay. <laughs> the slides and ask more questions in the pub. Pub, and yeah, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I think yeah, that, that actually concludes. So this is the repo. Um, uh, the master branch is ready. Uh, it is working, but uh, we still have not launched it. We're doing some more testing. Uh, I would love to get C, C++ in, but uh, it's, it's going to be fingers crossed. Um, and we are, we are trying to uh, improve the messaging where the um, bill of materials also includes information about containers, nobody asked. So if the application were wrapped inside a container, then the reachability definition changes. So uh, I have a small project uh, investigating whether that can be solved, part of V5. If not, yeah, it'll come later next year. Um, but uh, the, you can follow us. Uh, DevScan, completely free to use. Um, pip install OS DevScan. Um, and um, the, uh, the customer we signed up yesterday is Dependency track project. Okay, so um, uh, earlier this week, uh, dependency track had an alert for this Jackson data bind, this CVE, uh, with a famer, famous four letter commercial company. Everybody got notified, Steve got notified, everybody were panicking. And then they did all the triaging and then they concluded that it is not exploitable. And I was like, let's try DevScan. <laughs> this is the analysis from DevScan. No package requires immediate attention. And it even says all the reachable flows. And it even says there's no reachable flow for that CVE. So uh, yeah, dependency track is our first user.